actually we do get developed in the area is the alum industry. We've heard much mention of the Pennylands, the Pennylands made their money in the alum industry, which is developed right the way along the coast, along the Gisborough uh, uh, Hills and, and the Eston Hills. Uh, down the bottom here, we've got a, a shot of the, the alum workings of Quilby. Because the alum industry continued well beyond the 17th century, the 18th and 19th centuries, and so it's very difficult to isolate 17th century uh, alum workings because they've been obliterated by later workings. But nevertheless, this is a, uh, um, uh, an arrival of a major industry of the area, the area which, produce, which brings with it uh, a labor force, uh, some of these local labor force, which does bring the labor force in the area, and is no doubt a source of uh, people um, for, uh, for, for armies. More important than these changes are the changes, the basic changes for the landscape. We're going, we're moving from a landscape that is open, um, a medieval landscape of open field systems um, with um, uh, ridge and furrow, as you can see at the top there, it still survives the Gisborne Bell, uh, it's, um, near the Bellman Gate, um, to an enclosed landscape. We've already heard about the impact of enclosure on a battlefield, provide it much more difficult for troops to move across it. Durham is one of the areas of this country that, that moves to enclosure very quickly. Uh, in the second half of the 16th century, these open fields have been enclosed, so we move them from a very open landscape to a very enclosed landscape, so to this kind of landscape, which is uh, Peasbridge, there's Peasbridge there. Um, if you can imagine sweeping all of those uh, field boundaries away, you get a medieval landscape. Um, and in the 17th century, you're going through this process of enclosing this landscape. That clearly has an impact in, in military terms of moving around the landscape, but more important, uh, it is impact in agricultural terms. The drivers for the enclosure movement are about uh, landowners wanting greater control of their land to explore, exploit their land better. It's also about increasing pastoralism. Um, much greater use of livestock farming, um, the real reduction in the amount of seal farming that's going on. And all of these things are combining to make working on the land uh, much more, uh, you don't need as many people to work the land. Uh, you don't, because you, you, you're looking after livestock, you don't need people to harvest the crops, to plow the fields, etc. Because you're enclosing the fields, um, the, those people who uh, would normally have livestock uh, on common ground, the common ground was disappearing, it's all been enclosed. So the poor are being squeezed out of the <coughs> landscape. And again, this is a major source of conflict, a uh, major source of social conflict, as well as making a real change in the appearance of the landscape people were only just getting used to. <coughs> um, I put the, uh, the good old potato in there as, <laughs> as a Slight, as, as a reminder, we have also start getting the impact of new crops and also potato became, becomes a major uh, factor in the, both in the diet and the cropping, which becomes, starts to become widespread in the 17th century. So there are a whole raft of changes happening in the rural landscape. Uh, and you shouldn't underestimate the impact of bees in terms of the social peoples that lead to, lead to the city. <coughs> the other um, area of change uh, and one which causes, uh, in many cases, more, more problems in trying to, trying to get in touch with the 17th century is, is one to the buildings. <coughs> the, the end of the 17th century, after the Civil War, um, sees a great increase in wealth in this country, largely as a product of empire, as our, our first empire in, this, in, in the Americas begins to take off, and the wealth of that starts to come into this country. At the end of the 17th century, you get the great rebuilding. The, the ordinary housing stock is, is virtually swept away and replaced by new brick buildings. So to actually find a domestic house from the 17th century in Teesside or indeed anywhere else is quite rare. Uh, they just don't survive because in the 17th century, there have been largely wattle and door buildings, thatched roofs, basically medieval longhouses and uh, similar structures, all of which were gladly swept away at the end of the, uh, end of the 17th century and the 18th century in the brick building. <coughs> so um, here's an example. Uh, this is Middlesbrough Farm in 1618, which is actually quite a fine 17th century building um, with some typical 17th century uh, features like the dormer windows, 
uh, porches, mullioned, uh, and mullioned windows. Um, and this is what it looked like in 1808. Now, this is your typical 18th century farmstead, and this is more or less what all of us are used to seeing in our villages. So, whilst our villages are the same villages as in the 17th century and have much the same layout, the housing stock is virtually all 18th century. You go look very hard to find 17th century buildings. Um, and you know, you're the full and dog now, now closed, the typical example of an 18th century uh, farm building, which is typifies the villages of the area. So it's, it's a real problem trying to get a deal to the 17th century. And I only really began to appreciate how big a problem it was when I tried to put this talk together and try and find 17th century buildings to look at. Because there are very few of them around. <coughs> so um, these are the basic locations we picked out where you can actually see aspects of the 17th century uh, in the Tees Valley. Um, don't worry, I'm not going to go through them, them all, but uh, it's the beginning of the map we're going to need for us. Um, we've already heard uh, plenty about Pennyman and his, uh, his, his, his foot. There's Mars Court, you can go and see that. It's a uh, Cheshire home. Uh, you can walk past it and see it. It's very far from it. It's the best example of a 17th century hall in, in the Tees Valley, undoubtedly. And it's some classic 17th century features. Um, Tucked away in Mars High Street, you've got Winky's Castle. Um, it's, it's relatively elaborate for a 17th century building, but these days the classic features, nice dome windows, nice wooden windows. Um, probably somebody of relatively high status, you wouldn't have a nice stone house like this in the 17th century unless you were a reasonably wealthy yeoman farmer. Um, this is not the peasant's house by any means, but it is, it is a classic 17th century building. Uh, we've been around during the Civil War when Penny was raising his things. That's just his plaque in Christchurch when he's in, in Oxford. Um, Kirkleatham, I really struggled about whether to put Kirkleatham on or not. The only, what swung it really was the fact that the parish armory is in the museum, so you can actually go and see the 17th century armour. We've got Turner's Arms Houses, built in 1673, but again heavily rebuilt in the 18th century. We've also got the Turner Mausoleum here, which has got memorial plaques, which is an 18th century structure, which has got memorial plaques of the Turner family for the 17th century. So it's really 18th century, but you know, the bits of 17th century are probably just about worth the while going to have a look at. Gisborough, Phil's already talked about Gisborough and the Battle of Gisborough, uh, and I won't go through all of that again. Uh, however, if the, battle, if the battle took place over there, we're stuffed. If the battle clip took place over, he over here, then you've still got a nice open landscape there. Potentially we could look at that and um, do some work on that landscape. And of course you've got the ruins of the Priory. As it sits now, it's, it's product of the 18th century uh, landscape movement, but nevertheless, at the very least, those stones would still would have been there in the 17th century. There would probably been a lot more stones there as well, but of course would have been there. Pierce Bridge, again, um, you know all, all there is to know about Pierce Bridge by now. However, um, there's a cannon here for the Pierce Bridge. Um, in Pierce Bridge, you've actually got not only the bridge itself, but this end of the George Hotel is 17th century structure, although it doesn't look much like it now, but it is. And it's a very welcome approach. There's a goodness who's going there, plus you're going to the 17th century in the Civil War. And there is actually some army. 18th century building in there, Pierce Bridge, I think they hold the photograph of as well. So there are a couple of set of surviving 17th century structures in Pierce Bridge as well as the bridge that are worth having a look at, as well as trying to reenact the battle. Um, we will be doing a project in Pierce Bridge as part of the routines we discovered. Uh, unfortunately, Pierce Bridge also hosts a big Roman fort, um, which sort of gets in the way of it. But, um, <laughs> and nevertheless, we will try and find out more about what happened on the ground in the English Civil War. High Connorscliffe, uh, Phil's already mentioned High Connorscliffe, and it's linked to the Battle of Pierce Bridge because Colonel Howard is buried in the churchyard of High Connorscliffe Church, a nice medieval church. Nothing particularly 17th century about it, but there is a nice 17th century hall at High Connorscliffe, so we can build that into the tour quite nicely. Um, Yarm and Eggless Cliff, again, you've heard all about this one out of nauseam. Um, but, um, Jeff was just asking about the forts. Well, um, we have a letter from 1640 which describes Colonel Culpepper uh, providing um, units to look after the forts at um, 
Hi, Wurzel, Wurzel, and Fardy. So we know there's a Ford here at Wurzel. We know there's another Ford around here at High Wurzel, and at Fardy, the Ford's here. The other Ford's here. What's particularly interesting about the Ford at Hardy, Hardy, is that we think we've got a Roman marching camp in there as well, um, which is going to be investigated as part of the TV School program in September. Um, and we already know that there are uh, musket balls coming out of this area as well. So um, you can also plot the river at Yarm just, just here. <coughs> so there are, you know, there are various aspects of that landscape you can look at. <coughs> you know, again, you know, it's all about seeing it in the round and people trying to wear planky movements, guard forms, and all the rest of it. So it wasn't just a straightforward um, situation of military and bridges, all right, you've got to guard those four crossings as well. Um, Eggers Cliff, you've seen that in the item. <coughs> Whilst the church itself is medieval, the interior is late 17th century, post Civil War, but with a direct link to the Civil War because it has 17th century woodwork that derives from um, the work of Bishop, Bishop Cousin of, of Durham, uh, refurbishing the, the churches of the diocese after the Civil War. He was heavily involved in the Royalist cause, uh, and Bazia was still rector here. Uh, when this woodwork was put in. Um, we've also got the old hall here, which is in a slightly worse state for re re repairing now, but um, it's late medieval, at least 16th century, maybe even slightly earlier than that. It certainly had been there uh, during the Civil War. Um, for a change, it's uh, not one of those that Cromwell looked about, or maybe just to, uh, just to mention uh, that uh, the litigation of much later day. Yarm, um, Yarm Bridge, and all that. Uh, we do have late 17th century buildings surviving in, in Yarm, the Ketterdox, um, and again in your classic dormers. Um, but these are late 17th centuries. So, as far as I'm aware, there are only two medieval buildings surviving in Yarm Park of the Church. Um, I'm sure these are those. And there may be others hiding. Um, but Yarm really was um, a victim, if you want to put that way, of the great rebuilding. Uh, Yarm is, is all late 17th to, to about, well, it's about 1670 to 1750, uh, completely rebuilt. Very handsome place, but in terms of looking for early 17th century, it's not very helpful. <coughs> uh, High Low Wurzel, two of the forts. Uh, High Wurzel is now a deserted medieval village, um, so not a lot of joy there, really. Um, <coughs> Low Wurzel. Um, has more going for it, although there are no 17th century buildings that sort of looking across the green towards the Tees. There are no 17th century buildings in Low Wurzel, however, we will be doing a project in Low Wurzel as part of the Tees. We're just going to look at the green and the areas behind the green, and if there's civil war activity now, I expect us to pick it up. Stockton, uh, Phil's mentioned Stockton, uh, the castle's here with a big moat around it and new works built during the Civil War. You've already seen that image at the top of the castle. Um, <coughs> these are the stone houses on um, Pickle Street, which are uh, reputedly built from stone from the castle. They do a lot of uh, well, late 70s, if you know this. Um, and it's also reminded you've got the uh, Preston Hall Museum, this great uh, uh, armory collection. What intrigues me about Stockton is they do talk about new works from the Civil War that were slighted, but there's no, we don't really know what the new works were, um, whether they were alterations to the, the castle or they were some kind of, uh, of, of outworks. Uh, <coughs> we do know there were six soldiers buried in the churchyard here, and Bishop Morton fled to Stockton Church when the Scots came down, uh, and there was a Scots garrison here for a period of time as well, um, until 1647, when the potential was of the castle. So it did play a part. It was, it was a garrison town, but it wasn't a focus of activity in the same way. There are a lot of records of local people complaining about the Scots' uh, depredations and having to provide supplies to Scots. And again, the impoverishment of the area created by having to maintain the Scottish army shouldn't be underestimated. It was a, it was a real problem. Uh, a lot of people had to provide the supplies to the Scots over a period of uh, uh, five or six years. Parker Pool, uh, you've already heard mention of uh, Parker Pool. Um, 
sits on the, this headland here. Um, <coughs> very nice medieval defenses. This is a print of uh, the late 18th century, so they would certainly have been standing to this extent during the 17th century. We've got references of, to the actual defenses themselves being refurbished by the Scots during the, 17th, during the Civil War. There was this plan from 1638 to create another berry, which uh, might have done wonders for Hartwell's tourism, but wouldn't do anything for the medieval town. Um, this is uh, an engraving of the uh, uh, mid 17th century. <coughs> so we have this reference from Sir Cuthbert Sharp from 1816, saying during the Civil War, Hartpool was placed in defence of the state, the remains of which are still visible on the moor and in the Farwell field. Um, so this is the moor. Uh, we're looking across the town wall here. Now, we may all look like hops and bugs to you, but it, it, it's quite clear that you've got to do deliberate defensive installations here, probably here as well. And it looks as though we've got, got these uh, uh, we've got maps here, uh, something going on there as well, and something going on there, and then these entrenchments across the town door here. So it's quite clear that as well as doing works to the wall, they threw quite a lot of uh, a lot of earthworks at Um The outbreak of the Civil War is garrisoned for the king taken by the Scots in July 1644. Um, the Royal was allowed to march out. Um, Scots stayed there until 1647, uh, and then a parliamentary garrison was put in place. The government, in inverted commas, has always been uncertain about Hartlepool, uh, usually for correct reasons. <laughs> um, it's always been seen as a potential point where uh, European forces could land where basically the Hartley Flood Unit would, would welcome anybody who didn't come from the rest of England. <laughs> 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 that could be used as a, as, a, as, a, as a starting point for campaigns, as it was in the 12th century. It would go right back to the 12th century with uh, opposing armies landing in Hartley Flood, which is why in 1638 they had that uh, proposed plan for Hartley Flood. In 1658, they garrisoned it because they were afraid of the Dutch, as the Dutch wars broke out. Um, so it is an area that was regarded as a, as a flashpoint um, throughout the uh, 17th century. What survives in Hartlepool? Well, um, we do have a good stretch of the medieval town wall surviving here with the Sandwell Gate, which is uh, um, uh, probably early 15th century. Um, the town wall is a little bit like the uh, the old broom that's uh, got a new head and a new, and a new shaft, but it's still the old broom. It's been rebuilt several times and it's a major process at the moment. Clearly, there are elements of, we, we think we found an important money gun platform, and it's clearly the civil war that's been caught up with the platforms as well. St. Hilda's Church, nice medieval church, and then we've got the Friarage Mansion. Um, built in the 16th century and on the site of the Franciscan Friary. Um, Originally U shaped, you have one arm going down here, another going parallel to the street. <coughs> the other two arms have gone. But what we've got here is a 17th century elevation. So uh, you can see the foot moldings of the windows, and these windows were all originally mullioned. So this is contemporary to the Civil War. The two end elevations are 19th century replacements of 17th century elevations. And then on the other face, you've actually got a 16th century elevation where it originally. Uh, went into the courtyard. It's a wonderful exercise in architecture to walk around it because you have to go to a few and you walk around it. Nevertheless, that's that's what you saw in the end of the 17th century. Um, and that leads on to this one. We haven't really mentioned the war at sea, and it's probably something that needs more examination in the area. Uh, we have had reference to the London to the London coal trade in Newcastle Colliers, and that was a really important trade with lots of vessels going up and down the coast. Um, we know there was some naval activity along our coastline. Uh, this, well, this may or may not be Graham Mitchell, um, but he was, uh, well, he's got a long story, but basically uh, he ends up as a privateer um, uh, raiding uh, uh, shipping along the coast. We've got a couple of references to um, war at sea. Um, 
as far as Hartlepool is concerned, we've got a reference to an Irish frigate being boarded, uh, an Irish frigate boarding a Newcastle ship near Hartlepool, and the governor of Hartlepool uh, moving some of his guns and shot the Irish special through and through, uh, and the prize came to sit at Hartlepool. We've got also got another reference to pirates chasing uh, or trying to uh, take um, material off a ship that was uh, beached at. Um, on the tip, vessels which quite normally beach Port Road and things. Um, so 1649, Paris took out vessel from Tegas, she lay on the ground and removed, removed butter, pursued by a party put from half the pool, they fled. Um, so you know, there are things going on along the coast that we haven't really begun to think about yet. Um, there's also uh, things a bit like, uh, like I do in the 17th century, we all at sea. Um, right, that's me done, thank you. <laughs> Thank you.